Shukdev Goswami continued, In this sixth Manvantara millennium, Lord Vishnu, the master of the universe, appeared in his partial expansion. He was begotten by Vairaja in the womb of his wife Devasambhuti and his name was Ajita. By churning the ocean of milk, Ajita produced nectar for the demigods. In the form of a tortoise, he moved here and there, carrying on his back the great mountain known as Mandara. O great Brahman, Shukdev Goswami, why and how did Lord Vishnu churn the ocean of milk? For what reason did he stay in the water as a tortoise and hold up Mandara mountain? How did the demigods obtain the nectar? And what other things were produced from the churning of the ocean? Kindly describe all these wonderful activities of the Lord. My heart, which is disturbed by the three miserable conditions of material life, is not yet sated with hearing you describe the glorious activities of the Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the master of the devotees. Sri Sutta Goswami said, O learned Brahmins assembled here at Naimasharanya, when Shukdev Goswami, the son of Dvaipayana, was thus questioned by the king, he congratulated the king and then endeavored to describe further the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Shukdev Goswami said, when the Asuras, with their serpent weapons, severely attacked the demigods in a fight, many of the demigods fell and lost their lives. Indeed, they could not be revived. At that time, O king, the demigods had been cursed by Dravasa Muni. The three worlds were poverty-stricken, and therefore ritualistic ceremonies could not be performed. The effects of this were very serious. Lord Indra, Varuna and the other demigods, seeing their lives in such a state, consulted amongst themselves, but they could not find any solution. Then all the demigods assembled and went together to the peak of Sumeru mountain. There, in the assembly of Lord Brahma, they fell down to offer Lord Brahma their obeisances, and then they informed him of all the incidents that had taken place. Upon seeing that the demigods were bereft of all influence and strength, and that the three worlds were consequently devoid of auspiciousness, and upon seeing that the demigods were in an awkward position, whereas all the demons were flourishing, Lord Brahma, who is above all the demigods and who is most powerful, concentrated his mind on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Thus being encouraged, he became bright-faced and spoke to the demigods as follows. Lord Brahma said, I, Lord Shiva, all of you demigods, the demons, the living entities born of perspiration, the living beings born of eggs, the trees and plants sprouting from the earth, and the living entities born from embryos, all come from the Supreme Lord from his incarnation of Rajoguna, that is, myself, the Guna Avatar, and from the great sages or rishis who are part of me. Let us therefore go to the Supreme Lord and take shelter of his lotus feet. For the Supreme Personality of Godhead, there is no one to be killed, no one to be protected, no one to be neglected, and no one to be worshipped. Nonetheless, for the sake of creation, maintenance, and annihilation according to time, he accepts different forms as incarnations, either in the mode of goodness, the mode of passion, or the mode of ignorance. Now is the time to invoke the mode of goodness of the living entities who have accepted material bodies. The mode of goodness is meant to establish the Supreme Lord's rule, which will maintain the existence of the creation. Therefore, this is the opportune moment to take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead.
Because he is naturally very kind and dear to the demigods, he will certainly bestow good fortune upon us. O Maharaj Pariksit, subduer of all enemies, after Lord Brahma finished speaking to the demigods, he took them with him to the abode of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is beyond this material world. The Lord's abode is on an island called Shvetadvip, which is situated in the ocean of milk. There at Shvetadvip, Lord Brahma offered prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even though he had never seen the Supreme Lord. Simply because Lord Brahma had heard about the Supreme Personality of Godhead from Vedic literature, with a fixed mind, he offered the Lord prayers as written or approved by Vedic literature. Lord Brahma said, O Supreme Lord, O changeless, unlimited Supreme Truth, you are the origin of everything. Being all-pervading, you are in everyone's heart and also in the atom. You have no material qualities. Indeed, you are inconceivable. The mind cannot catch you by speculation, and words fail to describe you. You are the supreme master of everyone, and therefore you are worshipable for everyone. We offer our respectful obeisances unto you. The Supreme Personality of Godhead directly and indirectly knows how everything, including the living force, mind and intelligence, is working under His control. He is the illuminator of everything and has no ignorance. He does not have a material body subject to the reactions of previous activities, and he is free from the ignorance of partiality and materialistic education. I therefore take shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, who is eternal, all-pervading, and as great as the sky, and who appears with six opulences in three yugas, Satya, Treta, and Vapara. In the cycle of material activities, the material body resembles the wheel of a mental chariot. The ten senses, five for working and five for gathering knowledge, and the five life heirs within the body form the fifteen spokes of the chariot's wheel. The three modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, are its center of activities, and the eight ingredients of nature, earth, water, fire, air, sky, mind, intelligence, and false ego, comprise the rim of the wheel. The external material energy moves this wheel like electrical energy. Thus the wheel revolves very quickly around its hub or central support, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the Super Soul and the Ultimate Truth. We offer our respectful obeisances unto Him. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is situated in pure goodness or Shuddha Sattva, and therefore he is Eka Varna, the Omkar or Pranava. Because the Lord is beyond the cosmic manifestation, which is considered to be darkness, he is not visible to material eyes. Nonetheless, he is not separated from us by time or space, but is present everywhere. Seated on his carrier, Garuda, he is worshipped by means of mystical yogic power by those who have achieved freedom from agitation. Let us all offer our respectful obeisances unto him. No one can overcome the Supreme Personality of Godhead's illusory energy or maya, which is so strong that it bewilders everyone, making one lose the sense to understand the aim of life. That same Maya, however, is subdued by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who rules everyone, and who is equally disposed toward all living entities. 
So let us offer our respectful obeisances unto him. Since our bodies are made of sattva guna, we, the demigods, are internally and externally situated in goodness. All the great saints are also situated in that way. Therefore, if even we cannot understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead, what is to be said of those who are most insignificant in their bodily constitutions, being situated in the modes of passion and ignorance? How can they understand the Lord? Let us offer our respectful obeisances unto Him. On this earth there are four kinds of living entities who are all created by Him. The material creation rests on His lotus feet. He is the great supreme person, full of opulence and power. May He be pleased with us. The entire cosmic manifestation has emerged from water, and it is because of water that all living entities endure, live, and develop. This water is nothing but the semen of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, may the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who has such great potency, be pleased with us. Soma, the moon, is the source of food grains, strength, and longevity for all the demigods. He is also the master of all vegetation and the source of generation for all living entities. As stated by learned scholars, the moon is the mind of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. May that Supreme Personality of Godhead, the source of all opulences, be pleased with us. Fire, which is born for the sake of accepting oblations in ritualistic ceremonies, is the mouth of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Fire exists within the depths of the ocean to produce wealth, and fire is also present in the abdomen to digest food and produce various secretions for the maintenance of the body. May that supremely powerful personality of Godhead be pleased with us. The Sun God marks the path of liberation, which is called Achiradi Vartma. He is the chief source for understanding of the Vedas. He is the abode where the absolute truth can be worshipped. He is the gateway to liberation, and he is the source of eternal life as well as the cause of death. The Sun God is the eye of the Lord. May that Supreme Lord, who is supremely opulent, be pleased with us. All living entities, moving and non-moving, receive their vital force, their bodily strength and their very lives from the air. All of us follow the air for our vital force, exactly as servants follow an emperor. The vital force of air is generated from the original vital force of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. May that Supreme Lord be pleased with us. May the supremely powerful Personality of Godhead be pleased with us. The different directions are generated from his ears, the holes of the body come from his heart, and the vital force the senses, the mind, the air within the body, and the ether, which is the shelter of the body, come from his navel. Mahendra, the king of heaven, was generated from the prowess of the Lord. The demigods were generated from the mercy of the Lord. Lord Shiva was generated from the anger of the Lord, and Lord Brahma from his sober intelligence. The Vedic mantras were generated from the bodily holes of the Lord, and the great saints and prajapatis were generated from his genitals. May that supremely powerful Lord be pleased with us. The goddess of fortune was generated from his chest, the inhabitants of Pitriloka from his shadow, religion from his bosom, and irreligion the opposite of religion from his back. The heavenly planets were generated from the top of his head, and the apsaras from his sense enjoyment. 
May that supremely powerful personality of Godhead be pleased with us. The Brahmins and Vedic knowledge come from the mouth of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Kshatriyas and bodily strength come from his arms. The Vaishyas and their expert knowledge in productivity and wealth come from his thighs. And the Shudras who are outside of Vedic knowledge come from his feet. May that Supreme Personality of Godhead who is full in prowess be pleased with us. Greed is generated from his lower lip, affection from his upper lip, bodily luster from his nose, animalistic lusty desires from his sense of touch, yamaraj from his eyebrows, and eternal time from his eyelashes. May that Supreme Lord be pleased with us. All learned men say that the five elements eternal time, fruit of activity, the three modes of material nature, and the varieties produced by these modes are all creations of Yoga Maya. This material world is therefore extremely difficult to understand, but those who are highly learned have rejected it. May the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the controller of everything, be pleased with us. Let us offer our respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is completely silent, free from endeavor, and completely satisfied by his own achievements. He is not attached to the activities of the material world through his senses. Indeed, in performing his pastimes in this material world, he is just like the unattached heir. O Supreme Personality of Godhead, we are surrendered unto you, yet we wish to see you. Please make your original form and smiling lotus face visible to our eyes and appreciable to our other senses. O Lord, O Supreme Personality of Godhead, by your sweet will you appear in various incarnations, millennium after millennium, and act wonderfully, performing uncommon activities that would be impossible for us. Karmis are always anxious to accumulate wealth for their sense gratification, but for that purpose they must work very hard. Yet even though they work hard, the results are not satisfying. Indeed, sometimes their work results only in frustration. But devotees who have dedicated their lives to the service of the Lord can achieve substantial results without working very hard. These results exceed the devotees' expectations. Activities dedicated to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even if performed in small measure, never go in vain. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, being the Supreme Father, is naturally very dear and always ready to act for the good of the living entities. When one pours water on the root of a tree, the trunk and branches of the tree are automatically pleased. Similarly, when one becomes a devotee of Lord Vishnu, everyone is served, for the Lord is the Supersoul of everyone. My Lord, all obeisances unto you, who are eternal, beyond time's limits of past, present, and future. You are inconceivable in your activities. You are the master of the three modes of material nature, and, being transcendental to all material qualities, you are free from material contamination. You are the controller of all three of the modes of nature, but at the present you are in favor of the quality of goodness. Let us offer our respectful obeisances unto you. Sri Shukdev Goswami said, O King Pariksit, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari, being thus worshipped with prayers by the demigods and Lord Brahma, appeared before them. 
his bodily effulgence resembled the simultaneous rising of thousands of suns. The vision of all the demigods was blocked by the Lord's effulgence. Thus they could see neither the sky, the directions, the land, nor even themselves, what to speak of seeing the Lord who was present before them. Lord Brahma, along with Lord Shiva, saw the crystal clear personal beauty of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, whose blackish body resembles a Marakata gem, whose eyes are reddish like the depths of a lotus, who is dressed with garments that are yellow like molten gold, and whose entire body is attractively decorated. They saw his beautiful smiling lotus-like face, crowned by a helmet bedecked with valuable jewels. The Lord has attractive eyebrows, and his cheeks are adorned with earrings. Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva saw the belt on the Lord's waist, the bangles on his arms, the necklace on his chest, and the ankle bells on his legs. The Lord is bedecked with flower garlands, his neck is decorated with the coast of a gem, and he carries with him the goddess of fortune and his personal weapons like his disc and club. When Lord Brahma, along with Lord Shiva and other demigods, saw the form of the Lord, they all immediately fell to the ground, offering their obeisances. Lord Brahma said, Although you are never born, your appearance and disappearance as an incarnation never cease. You are always free from the material qualities, and you are the shelter of transcendental bliss resembling an ocean. Eternally existing in your transcendental form, you are the supreme subtle of the most extremely subtle. We therefore offer our respectful obeisances unto you, the Supreme, whose existence is inconceivable. O best of persons, O Supreme Director, those who actually aspire for supreme good fortune, worship this form of your Lordship according to the Vedic Tantras. My Lord, we can see all the three worlds in you. My dear Lord, who are always fully independent, this entire cosmic manifestation arises from you, rests upon you, and ends in you. Your Lordship is the beginning sustenance and end of everything, like the earth, which is the cause of an earthen pot, which supports the pot, and to which the pot, when broken, finally returns. O Supreme, you are independent in yourself and do not take help from others. Through your own potency, you create this cosmic manifestation and enter it. Those who are advanced in Krishna consciousness, who are fully in knowledge of the authoritative Shastra, and who, through the practice of Bhakti Yoga, are cleansed of all material contamination, can see with their clear minds that although you exist within the transformations of the material qualities, your presence is untouched by these qualities. As one can derive fire from wood, milk from the milk bag of the cow, food grains and water from the land, and prosperity in one's livelihood from industrial enterprises, so by the practice of bhakti yoga, even within this material world, one can achieve your favor or intelligently approach you. Those who are pious all affirm this. Elephants afflicted by a forest fire become very happy when they get water from the Ganges. Similarly, O oh my Lord, from whose navel grows a lotus flower, since you have now appeared before us, we have become transcendentally happy. By seeing your Lordship, whom we have desired to see for a very long time, we have achieved our ultimate goal in life. My Lord, we, the various demigods, the directors of this universe, have come to your lotus feet. Please fulfill the purpose for which we have come. You are the witness of everything, from within and without. Nothing is unknown to you, 
and therefore it is unnecessary to inform you again of anything. I, Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and all the demigods, accompanied by the Prajapatis like Daksha, are nothing but sparks illuminated by you, who are the original fire. Since we are particles of you, what can we understand about our welfare? O Supreme Lord, please give us the means of deliverance that is suitable for the Brahmins and demigods. When the Lord was thus offered prayers by the demigods, headed by Lord Brahma, he understood the purpose for which they had approached him. Therefore, in a deep voice that resembled the rumbling of clouds, the Lord replied to the demigods, who all stood there attentively with folded hands. Although the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the master of the demigods, was capable of performing the activities of the demigods by himself, he wanted to enjoy pastimes in churning the ocean. Therefore he spoke as follows. O Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and other demigods, please hear me with great attention, for what I say will bring good fortune for all of you. As long as you are not flourishing, you should make aturas who are now being favored by time. O demigods, fulfilling one's own interests is so important that one may even have to make a truce with one's enemies. For the sake of one's interest, one has to act according to the logic of the snake and the mouse. Immediately endeavor to produce nectar, which a person who is about to die may drink to become immortal. O demigods, cast into the ocean of milk all kinds of vegetables, grass, creepers and drugs. Then with my help, making Mandara Mountain the churning rod and Vasuki the rope for churning, churn the ocean of milk with undiverted attention. Thus the demons will be engaged in labor, but you, the demigods, will gain the actual result, the nectar produced from the ocean. My dear demigods, with patience and peace everything can be done, but if one is agitated by anger, the goal is not achieved. Therefore, whatever the demons ask, agree to their proposal. A poison known as Kalakuta will be generated from the ocean of milk, but you should not fear it. And when various products are churned from the ocean, you should not be greedy for them or anxious to obtain them, nor should you be angry. O King Pariksit, after advising the demigods in this way, the independent Supreme Personality of Godhead, the best of all living entities, disappeared from their presence. Then Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, after offering their respectful obeisances to the Lord, returned to their abodes. All the demigods then approached Maharaj Bali. Maharaj Bali, a most celebrated king of the demons, knew very well when to make peace and when to fight. Thus, although his commanders and captains were agitated and were about to kill the demigods, Maharaj Bali, seeing that the demigods were coming to him without a militant attitude, forbade his commanders to kill them. The demigods approached Bali Maharaj, the son of Virochana, and sat down near him. Bali Maharaj was protected by the commanders of the demons and was most opulent, having conquered all the universes. After pleasing Bali Maharaj with mild words, Lord Indra, the king of the demigods, who was most intelligent, very politely submitted all the proposals he had learned from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu. 
The proposals submitted by King Indra were immediately accepted by Mali Maharaj and his assistants, headed by Shambhara and Arishtanemi, and by all the other residents of Tripura. O Maharaj Pariksit, chastiser of the enemies, the demigods and the demons thereafter made an armistice between them. Then, with great enterprise, they arranged to produce nectar as proposed by Lord Indra. Thereafter, with great strength, the demons and demigods, who were all very powerful and who had long, stout arms, uprooted Mandara Mountain. Crying very loudly, they brought it toward the ocean of milk. Because of conveying the great mountain for a long distance, King Indra, Maharaj Bali, and the other demigods and demons became fatigued. Being unable to carry the mountain, they left it on the way. The mountain known as Mandra, which was extremely heavy, being made of gold, fell and smashed many demigods and demons. The demigods and demons were frustrated and disheartened, and their arms, thighs, and shoulders were broken. Therefore, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who knows everything, appeared there on the back of his carrier, Garuda. Observing that most of the demons and the demigods had been crushed by the falling of the mountain, the Lord glanced over them and brought them back to life. Thus they became free from grief, and they even had no bruises on their bodies. The Lord very easily lifted the mountain with one hand and placed it on the back of Garuda. Then he too got on the back of Garuda and went to the ocean of milk surrounded by the demigods and demons. Thereafter, Garuda, the chief of birds, unloaded Mandara mountain from his shoulder and brought it near the water. Then he was asked by the Lord to leave that place, and he left. Shukdev Goswami said, O best of the Kurus, Maharaj Pariksit, the demigods and demons summoned Vasuki, king of the serpents, requesting him to come and promising to give him a share of the nectar. They coiled Vasuki around Mandara mountain as a churning rope, and with great pleasure they endeavored to produce nectar by churning the ocean of milk. The personality of Godhead, Ajita, grasped the front portion of the snake, and then the demigods followed. The leaders of the demons thought it unwise to hold the tail, the inauspicious portion of the snake. Instead, they wanted to hold the front, which had been taken by the personality of Godhead and the demigods, because that portion was auspicious and glorious. Thus the demons, on the plea that they were all highly advanced students of Vedic knowledge and were all famous for their birth and activities, protested that they wanted to hold the front of the snake. Thus the demons remained silent, opposing the desire of the demigods. Seeing the demons and understanding their motive, the personality of God had smiled. Without discussion, he immediately accepted their proposal by grasping the tail of the snake, and the demigods followed him. After thus adjusting how the snake was to be held, the sons of Kashyapa, both demigods and demons, began their activities, desiring to get nectar by churning the ocean of milk. O son of the Pandu dynasty, when Mandara mountain was thus being used as a churning rod in the ocean of milk, it had no support, and therefore, although held by the strong hands of the demigods and demons, it sank into the water. Because the mountain had been sunk by the strength of providence, the demigods and demons were disappointed, and their faces seemed to shrivel. Seeing the situation that had been created by the will of the Supreme, the unlimitedly powerful Lord, whose determination is infallible, took the wonderful shape of a tortoise, entered the water, and lifted the great Mandara mountain.
When the demigods and demons saw that Mandara Mountain had been lifted, they were enlivened and encouraged to begin churning again. The mountain rested on the back of the great tortoise, which extended for 800,000 miles like a large island. O king, when the demigods and demons, by the strength of their arms, rotated Mandra Mountain on the back of the extraordinary tortoise, the tortoise accepted the rolling of the mountain as a means of scratching his body, and thus he felt a pleasing sensation. Thereafter, Lord Vishnu entered the demons as the quality of passion, the demigods as the quality of goodness, and Vasuki as the quality of ignorance, to encourage them and increase their various types of strength and energy. Manifesting himself with thousands of hands, the Lord then appeared on the summit of Mandara Mountain, like another great mountain, and held Mandara Mountain with one hand. In the upper planetary systems, Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, along with Indra, King of Heaven, and other demigods, offered prayers to the Lord and showered flowers upon Him. The demigods and demons worked almost madly for the nectar, encouraged by the Lord, who was above and below the mountain, and who had entered the demigods, the demons, Vasuki, and the mountain itself. Because of the strength of the demigods and demons, the ocean of milk was so powerfully agitated that all the alligators in the water were very much perturbed. Nonetheless, the churning of the ocean continued in this way. Vasuki had thousands of eyes and mouths. From his mouths he breathed smoke and blazing fire, which affected the demons headed by Poloma, Kaleya, Bali, and Ilbala. Thus the demons, who appeared like sarala trees burned by a forest fire, gradually became powerless. Because the demigods were also affected by the blazing breath of Vasuki, their bodily lusters diminished, and their garments, garlands, Weapons and faces were blackened by smoke. However, by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, clouds appeared on the sea, pouring torrents of rain, and breezes blew, carrying particles of water from the sea waves to give the demigods relief. When nectar did not come from the ocean of milk, despite so much endeavor by the best of the demigods and demons, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Ajita, personally began to churn the ocean. The Lord appeared like a blackish cloud. He was dressed with yellow garments. His earrings shone on his ears like lightning, and his hair spread over his shoulders. He wore a garland of flowers, and his eyes were pinkish. With his strong, glorious arms, which award fearlessness throughout the universe, he took hold of Vasuki and began churning the ocean, using Mandara Mountain as a churning rod. When engaged in this way, the Lord appeared like a beautifully situated mountain named Indra Nila. The fish, sharks, tortoises, and snakes were most agitated and perturbed. The entire ocean became turbulent, and even the large aquatic animals like whales, water elephants, crocodiles, and tamingala fish, or large whales that can swallow small whales, came to the surface. While the ocean was being churned in this way, it first produced a fiercely dangerous poison called hala hala. O king, when that uncontrollable poison was forcefully spreading up and down in all directions, all the demigods, along with the Lord himself, approached Lord Shiva, or Sadashiva. Feeling unsheltered and very much afraid, they sought shelter of him. 
the demigods observed Lord Shiva sitting on the summit of Kailas Hill with his wife, Bhavani, for the auspicious development of the three worlds. He was being worshipped by great saintly persons desiring liberation. The demigods offered him their obeisances and prayers with great respect. The Prajapati said, O greatest of all demigods, Mahadev, super-soul of all living entities and cause of their happiness and prosperity, we have come to the shelter of your lotus feet. Now please save us from this fiery poison which is spreading all over the three worlds. O Lord, you are the cause of bondage and liberation of the entire universe because you are its ruler. Those who are advanced in spiritual consciousness surrender unto you, and therefore you are the cause of mitigating their distresses, and you are also the cause of their liberation. We therefore worship your Lordship. O Lord, you are self-effulgent and supreme. You create this material world by your personal energy, and you assume the names Brahma, Vishnu, and Maheshvara when you act in creation, maintenance, and annihilation. You are the cause of all causes, the self-effulgent, inconceivable, impersonal Brahman, which is originally Parabrahman. You manifest various potencies in this cosmic manifestation. O oh Lord, you are the original source of Vedic literature. You are the original cause of material creation, the life force, the senses, the five elements, the three modes, and the Mahatattva. You are eternal time, determination, and the two religious systems called truth, or satya, and truthfulness, or ritta. You are the shelter of the syllable Om, which consists of three letters, A-U-M. O Father of all planets, learned scholars know that fire is your mouth, the surface of the globe is your lotus feet, eternal time is your movement, all the directions are your ears, and Varuna, master of the waters, is your tongue. O oh Lord, the sky is your navel, the air is your breathing, the sun is your eyes, and the water is your semen. You are the shelter of all kinds of living entities, high and low. The god of the moon is your mind, and the upper planetary system is your head. O oh Lord, you are the three Vedas personified. The seven seas are your abdomen, and the mountains are your bones. All drugs, creepers, and vegetables are the hairs on your body. The Vedic mantras like Gayatri are the seven layers of your body, and the Vedic religious system is the core of your heart. O oh Lord, the five important Vedic mantras are represented by your five faces, from which the thirty-eight most celebrated Vedic mantras have been generated. Your Lordship, being celebrated as Lord Shiva, is self-illuminated. You are directly situated as the Supreme Truth, known as Paramatma. O Lord, your shadow is seen in irreligion, which brings about varieties of irreligious creations. The three modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, are your three eyes. All of the Vedic literatures, which are full of verses, are emanations from you, because their compilers wrote the various scriptures after receiving your glance. O Lord Girisha, since the impersonal Brahman effulgence is transcendental to the material modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance, the various directors of this material world certainly cannot appreciate it or even know where it is. It is not understandable even to Lord Brahma, Lord Vishnu, or the King of Heaven, Mahendra. When annihilation is performed by the flames and sparks emanating from your eyes, the entire creation is burned to ashes. Nonetheless, you do not know how this happens. What then is to be said of your destroying the Daksha Yagya, Triporasura, and the Kalakuta poison? 
such activities cannot be subject matters for prayers offered to you. Exalted, self-satisfied persons who preach to the entire world think of your lotus feet constantly within their hearts. However, when persons who do not know your austerity see you moving with Uma, they misunderstand you to be lusty, or when they see you wandering in the crematorium, they mistakenly think that you are ferocious and envious. Certainly they are shameless. They cannot understand your activities. Even personalities like Lord Brahma and other demigods cannot understand your position, for you are beyond the moving and non-moving creation. Since no one can understand you in truth, how can one offer you prayers? It is impossible. As far as we are concerned, we are creatures of Lord Brahma's creation. Under the circumstances, therefore, we cannot offer you adequate prayers, but as far as our ability allows, we have expressed our feelings. O oh, greatest of all rulers, your actual identity is impossible for us to understand. As far as we can see, your presence brings flourishing happiness to everyone. Beyond this, no one can appreciate your activities. We can see this much and nothing more. Lord Shiva is always benevolent toward all living entities. When he saw that the living entities were very much disturbed by the poison which was spreading everywhere, he was very compassionate. Thus he spoke to his eternal consort, Sati, as follows. My dear Bhavani, just see how all these living entities have been placed in danger because of the poison produced from the churning of the ocean of milk. It is my duty to give protection and safety to all living entities struggling for existence. Certainly it is the duty of the master to protect his suffering dependence. People in general, being bewildered by the illusory energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, are always engaged in animosity toward one another. But devotees, even at the risk of their own temporary lives, try to save them. My dear gentle wife, Bhavani, when one performs benevolent activities for others, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari, is very pleased. And when the Lord is pleased, I am also pleased, along with all other living creatures. Therefore, let me drink this poison, for all the living entities may thus become happy because of me. <laughs> After informing Bhavani in this way, Lord Shiva began to drink the poison, and Bhavani, who knew perfectly well the capabilities of Lord Shiva, gave him her permission to do so. Thereafter, Lord Shiva, who is dedicated to auspicious, benevolent work for humanity, compassionately took the whole quantity of poison in his palm and drank it. As if in defamation, the poison born from the ocean of milk manifested its potency by marking Lord Shiva's neck with a bluish line. That line, however, is now accepted as an ornament of the Lord. It is said that great personalities almost always accept voluntary suffering because of the suffering of people in general. This is considered the highest method of worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is present in everyone's heart. Upon hearing of this act, everyone, including Bhavani, the daughter of Maharaj Daksha, Lord Brahma, Lord Vishnu, and the people in general, very highly praised this deed performed by Lord Shiva, who is worshipped by the demigods, and who bestows benedictions upon the people. Scorpions, cobras, poisonous drugs, and other animals whose bites are poisonous took the opportunity to drink whatever little poison had fallen and scattered from Lord Shiva's hand while he was drinking. Shukdev Goswami continued. Upon Lord Shiva's drinking the poison, both the demigods and the demons 
being very pleased, began to churn the ocean with renewed vigor. As a result of this, there appeared a cow known as Surabi. O King Pariksit, great sages who were completely aware of the Vedic ritualistic ceremonies took charge of that Surabi cow, which produced all the yogurt, milk and ghee absolutely necessary for offering oblations into the fire. They did this just for the sake of pure ghee, which they wanted for the performance of sacrifices to elevate themselves to the higher planetary systems up to Brahmaloka. Thereafter, a horse named Uchai Shrava, which was as white as the moon, was generated. Bali Maharaj desired to possess this horse, and Indra, the king of heaven, did not protest, for he had previously been so advised by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As the next result of the churning, the king of elephants, named Eravata, was generated. This elephant was white, and with its four tusks it defied the glories of Kailas Mountain, the glorious abode of Lord Shiva. Thereafter, O king, eight great elephants, which could go in any direction, were generated. They were headed by Eravana. Eight she-elephants, headed by Abramu, were also generated. Generated thereafter from the great ocean were the celebrated gems Kostuba Mani and Padmaraga Mani. Lord Vishnu, to decorate his chest, desired to possess them. Generated next was the Parijata flower, which decorates the celestial planets. O King, as you fulfill the desires of everyone on this planet by fulfilling all ambitions, the Parijata fulfills the desires of everyone. Next there appeared the Apsaras, who are used as prostitutes on the heavenly planets. They were fully decorated with golden ornaments and lockets, and were dressed in fine and attractive clothing. The Apsaras move very slowly in an attractive style that bewilders the inhabitants of the heavenly planets. Then there appeared the goddess of fortune, Rama, who is absolutely dedicated to being enjoyed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. She appeared like electricity, surpassing the lightning that might illuminate a marble mountain. Because of her exquisite beauty, her bodily features, her youth, her complexion and her glories, everyone, including the demigods, the demons and the human beings, desired her. They were attracted because she is the source of all opulences. The king of heaven, Indra, brought a suitable sitting place for the goddess of fortune. All the rivers of sacred water, such as the Ganges and Yamuna, personified themselves, and each of them brought pure water in golden water pots for Mother Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. The land became a person and collected all the drugs and herbs needed for installing the deity. The cows delivered five products, namely milk, yogurt, ghee, urine, and cow dung, and spring personified collected everything produced in spring during the months of Chaitra and Vaishaka, or April and May. The great sages performed the bathing ceremony of the goddess of fortune as directed in the authorized scriptures. The Gandharvas chanted all auspicious Vedic mantras, and the professional women dancers very nicely danced and sang authorized songs prescribed in the Vedas. The clouds in personified form beat various types of drums known as Murdangas, Panavas, Murajas, and Anakas. They also blew conch shells and bugles known as Gomukas, and played flutes and stringed instruments. The combined sound of these instruments was tumultuous. Thereafter, the great elephants from all the directions carried big water jugs full of Ganges water and bathed the goddess of fortune to the accompaniment of Vedic mantras chanted by learned Brahmins. While thus being bathed, the goddess of fortune maintained her original style with a lotus flower in her hand, and she appeared very beautiful. The goddess of fortune is the most chaste, for she does not know anyone but the supreme personality of Godhead. The ocean, 
which is the source of all valuable jewels, supply the upper and lower portions of a yellow silken garment. The predominating deity of the water, Varuna, presented flower garlands surrounded by six-legged bumblebees, drunken with honey. Vishvakarma, one of the Prajapatis, supplied varieties of decorated ornaments. The goddess of learning, Sadaspati, supplied a necklace. Lord Brahma supplied a lotus flower, and the inhabitants of Nagaloka supplied earrings. Thereafter, Mother Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, having been properly celebrated with an auspicious ritualistic ceremony, began moving about, holding in her hand a garland of lotus flowers, which was surrounded by humming bumblebees. Smiling with shyness, her cheeks decorated by her earrings, she looked extremely beautiful. Her two breasts, which were symmetrical and nicely situated, were covered with sandalwood pulp and kunkum powder, and her waist was very thin. As she walked here and there, her ankle bells jingling softly, she appeared like a creeper of gold. While walking among the Gandharvas, Yakshas, Asuras, Siddhas, Chadanas, and denizens of heaven, Lakshmi Devi, the goddess of fortune, was scrutinizingly examining them, but she could not find anyone naturally endowed with all good qualities. None of them was devoid of faults, and therefore she could not take shelter of any of them. The goddess of fortune, examining the assembly, thought in this way. Someone who has undergone great austerity has not yet conquered anger. Someone possesses knowledge, but he has not conquered material desires. Someone is a very great personality, but he cannot conquer lusty desires. Even a great personality depends on something else. How then can he be the supreme controller? Someone may possess full knowledge of religion, but still not be kind to all living entities. In someone, whether human or demigod, there may be renunciation, but that is not the cause of liberation. Someone may possess great power and yet be unable to check the power of eternal time. Someone else may have renounced attachment to the material world, yet he cannot compare to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, no one is completely freed from the influence of the material modes of nature. Someone may have longevity, but not have auspiciousness or good behavior. Someone may have both auspiciousness and good behavior, but the duration of his life is not fixed. Although such demigods as Lord Shiva have eternal life, they have inauspicious habits like living in crematoriums. And even if others are well qualified in all respects, they are not devotees of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In this way, after full deliberation, the goddess of fortune accepted Mukunda as her husband because, although he is independent and not in want of her, he possesses all transcendental qualities and mystic powers and is therefore the most desirable. Approaching the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the goddess of fortune placed upon his shoulders the garland of newly grown lotus flowers, which was surrounded by humming bumblebees searching for honey. Then, expecting to get a place on the bosom of the Lord, she remained standing by his side, her face smiling in shyness. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the father of the three worlds, and his bosom is the residence of Mother Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, the proprietor of all opulences. The goddess of fortune, by her favorable and merciful glance, can increase the opulence of the three worlds, along with their inhabitants and their directors, the demigods. The inhabitants of Gandharva Loka and Charana Loka then took the opportunity to play their musical instruments, such as conchels, bugles, and drums. They began dancing and singing along with their wives. 
Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, the great sage Angira, and similar directors of universal management showered flowers and chanted mantras indicating the transcendental glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. All the demigods, along with the Prajapatis and their descendants, being blessed by Lakshmiji's glance upon them, were immediately enriched with good behavior and transcendental qualities. Thus, they were very much satisfied. O King, because of being neglected by the Goddess of Fortune, the demons and Rakshasas were depressed, bewildered, and frustrated, and thus they became shameless. Next appeared Varuni, the lotus-eyed goddess who controls drunkards. With the permission of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, the demons, headed by Bali Maharaj, took possession of this young girl. O King, thereafter, while the sons of Kashyapa, both demons and demigods, were engaged in churning the ocean of milk, a very wonderful male person appeared. He was strongly built. His arms were long, stout, and strong. His neck, which was marked with three lines, resembled a conch shell. His eyes were reddish, and his complexion was blackish. He was very young, he was garlanded with flowers, and his entire body was fully decorated with various ornaments. He was dressed in yellow garments and wore brightly polished earrings made of pearls. The tips of his hair were anointed with oil, and his chest was very broad. His body had all good features, he was stout and strong like a lion, and he was decorated with bangles. In his hand he carried a jug filled to the top with nectar. This person was Danvantari, a plenary portion of a plenary portion of Lord Vishnu. He was very conversant with the science of medicine, and as one of the demigods he was permitted to take a share in sacrifices. Upon seeing Danvantari carrying the jug of nectar, the demons, desiring the jug and its contents, immediately snatched it away by force. When the jug of nectar was carried off by the demons, the demigods were morose. Thus they sought shelter at the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari. When the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who always desires to fulfill the ambitions of his devotees, saw that the demigods were morose, he said to them, Do not be aggrieved. By my own energy I shall bewilder the demons by creating a quarrel among them. In this way I shall fulfill your desire to have the nectar. O king, a quarrel then arose among the demons over who would get the nectar first. Each of them said, You cannot drink it first, I must drink it first, me first, not you. Some of the demons said, All the demigods have taken part in churning the ocean of milk. Now as everyone has an equal right to partake in any public sacrifice, according to the eternal religious system, it is befitting that the demigods now have a share of the nectar. O king, in this way the weaker demons forbade the stronger demons to take the nectar. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishnu, who can counteract any unfavorable situation, then assumed the form of an extremely beautiful woman. This incarnation as a woman, Mohini Murti, was most pleasing to the mind. Her complexion resembled in color a newly grown blackish lotus, and every part of her body was beautifully situated. Her ears were equally decorated with earrings. Her cheeks were very beautiful. Her nose was raised and her face full of youthful luster. Her large breasts made her waist seem very thin. Attracted by the aroma of her face and body, bumblebees hummed around her, and thus her eyes were restless. Her hair, which was extremely beautiful, was garlanded with malika flowers. Her attractively constructed neck was decorated with a necklace and other ornaments. Her arms were decorated with bangles. Her body was covered with a clean sari, and her breasts seemed like islands in an ocean of beauty. Her legs were decorated with ankle bells. 
because of the movements of her eyebrows, as she smiled with shyness and glanced over the demons, all the demons were saturated with lusty desires, and every one of them desired to possess her. Shukdev Goswami said, Thereafter, the demons became inimical toward one another. Throwing and snatching the container of nectar, they gave up their friendly relationship. Meanwhile, they saw a very beautiful young woman coming forward toward them. Upon seeing the beautiful woman, the demon said, Alas, how wonderful is her beauty! How wonderful the luster of her body! And how wonderful the beauty of her youthful age! Speaking in this way, they quickly approached her, full of lusty desires to enjoy her, and began to inquire from her in many ways. Oh, wonderfully beautiful girl! You have such nice eyes resembling the petals of a lotus flower. Who are you? Where do you come from? What is your purpose in coming here? And to whom do you belong? Oh, you whose thighs are extraordinarily beautiful, our minds are becoming agitated simply because of seeing you. What to speak of human beings, even the demigods, demons, siddhas, gandharvas, chadanas, and the various directors of the universe, the prajapatis, have never touched you before. It is not that we are unable to understand your identity. Oh, beautiful girl with beautiful eyebrows, certainly Providence, by his causeless mercy, has sent you to please the senses and minds of all of us. <laughs> Is this not a fact? Eh? We are now all engaged in enmity among ourselves because of this one subject matter, the container of nectar. Although we have been born in the same family, we are becoming increasingly inimical. Oh, thin-waisted woman, who are so beautiful in your prestigious position, we therefore request you to favor us by settling our dispute. All of us, both demons and demigods, have been born of the same father, Kashyapa, and thus we are related as brothers. But now we are exhibiting our personal prowess in dissension. Therefore, we request you to settle our dispute and divide the nectar equally among us. Having thus been requested by the demons, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who had assumed the form of a beautiful woman, began to smile. Looking at them with attractive feminine gestures, she spoke as follows. O oh, sons of Kashyapamuni, I am only a prostitute. How is it that you have so much faith in me? A learned person never puts his faith in a woman. <laughs> O oh, demons, as monkeys, jackals, and dogs are unsteady in their sexual relationships and want newer and newer friends every day, women who live independently seek new friends daily. Friendship with such a woman is never permanent. This is the opinion of learned scholars. After the demons heard the words of Mohini Murti, who had spoken as if jokingly, they were all very confident. They laughed with gravity, and ultimately they delivered the container of nectar into her hands. Thereafter, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, having taken possession of the container of nectar, smiled slightly and spoke in attractive words. She said, My dear demons, if you accept whatever I may do, whether honest or dishonest, then I can take responsibility for dividing the nectar among you. The chiefs of the demons were not very expert in deciding things. Upon hearing the sweet words of Mohini Murti, they immediately assented, Yes, they answered, what you have said is all right. Thus the demons agreed to accept her decision. The demigods and demons then observed a fast. After bathing, they offered clarified butter and oblations into the fire, and gave charity to the cows and to the Brahmins and members of the other orders of society, namely the Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras, who were all rewarded as they deserved. 
Thereafter, the demigods and demons performed ritualistic ceremonies under the directions of the Brahmins. Then they dressed themselves with new garments according to their own choice, decorated their bodies with ornaments, and sat facing east on seats made of kusha grass. O king, as the demigods and demons sat facing east in an arena fully decorated with flower garlands and lamps and fragrant with the smoke of incense, that woman, dressed in a most beautiful sari, her ankle bells tinkling, entered the arena, walking very slowly because of her big, low hips. Her eyes were restless due to youthful pride. Her breasts were like water jugs. Her thighs resembled the trunks of elephants, and she carried a water pot in her hand. Her attractive nose and cheeks and her ears adorned with golden earrings made her face very beautiful. As she moved, her sari's border on her breasts moved slightly aside. When the demigods and demons saw these beautiful features of Mohini Murti, who was glancing at them and slightly smiling, they were all completely enchanted. Demons are by nature crooked like snakes. Therefore, to distribute a share of the nectar to them was not at all feasible, since this would be as dangerous as supplying milk to a snake. Considering this, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who never falls down, did not deliver a share of nectar to the demons. The Supreme Personality of Godhead as Mohini Murti, the Master of the Universe, arranged separate lines of sitting places and seated the demigods and demons according to their positions. Taking the container of nectar in her hands, she first approached the demons, satisfied them with sweet words, and thus cheated them of their share of the nectar. Then she administered the nectar to the demigods, who were sitting at a distant place, to make them free from invalidity, old age, and death. O king, since the demons had promised to accept whatever the woman did, whether just or unjust, now, to keep this promise, to show their equilibrium and to save themselves from fighting with the woman, they remain silent. The demons had developed affection for Mohini Murti and a kind of faith in her, and they were afraid of disturbing their relationship. Therefore, they showed respect and honor to her words and did not say anything that might disturb their friendship with her. Rahu, the demon who causes eclipses of the sun and moon, covered himself with the dress of a demigod and thus entered the assembly of the demigods and drank nectar without being detected by anyone, even by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The moon and the sun, however, because of permanent animosity toward Rahu, understood the situation. Thus Rahu was detected. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hadi, using his disc, which was sharp like a razor, at once cut off Rahu's head. When Rahu's head was severed from his body, the body, being untouched by the nectar, could not survive. Rahu's head, however, having been touched by the nectar, became immortal. Thus Lord Brahma accepted Rahu's head as one of the planets. Since Rahu is an eternal enemy of the moon and the sun, he always tries to attack them on the nights of the full moon and the dark moon. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the best friend and well-wisher of the three worlds. Thus, when the demigods had almost finished drinking the nectar, the Lord, in the presence of all the demons, disclosed his original form. The place, the time, the cause, the purpose, the activity, and the ambition were all the same for both the demigods and the demons, but the demigods achieved one result and the demons another. Because the demigods are always under the shelter of the dust of the Lord's lotus feet, they could very easily drink the nectar and get its result. The demons, however, not having sought shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord, were unable to achieve the result they desired. 
In human society, there are various activities performed for the protection of one's wealth and life by one's words, one's mind, and one's actions. But they are all performed for one's personal or extended sense gratification with reference to the body. All these activities are baffled because of being separate from devotional service. But when the same activities are performed for the satisfaction of the Lord, the beneficial results are distributed to everyone, just as water poured on the root of a tree is distributed throughout the entire tree.